Hey, welcome back. Let's make another part. So this time I had to make 12 of these little things here. Let's call them things or flux capacitor plungers. These are prototype parts that are machined from 303 stainless, uh, 14305, which is a free cutting stainless steel that's just a joy to work with. The outside is not very complicated, just an OD, some chamfer screws and this little boss here in the center. But the ID is a little bit more complicated. It has an undercut in the back, a reamed hole and two grooves. I have a, a cutaway part here. This is, uh, I machined this completely and then scrapped it and decided to mill away half of, of the material to see how they look inside. You have two grooves and back here, that's where I messed it up is an undercut. I will show you that in, when we machine the part. And the rest is just a 2.5 millimeter through hole. So how do we make this part? Let's go back in time before I had 12 of these ready and see what we have. Okay, I'm in the process of roughing down this material. Okay, I'm in the process of roughing down this material to the rough shape of the part with 0.5 millimeter of allowance on all surfaces for two finishing passes. I'm using a CNMG insert at 1800 RPM and the feed of 60 microns per revolution. Okay, that's the part roughed out from side one. Now we change the tool to a SNMG insert. This is a square insert, positive geometry, 7 degree clearance to the bottom with a 45 degree lead. This is a very useful tool. First of all, these inserts have a very, very tough geometry due to the fact that they are 90 degrees. You can use these for roughing, facing and turning. Of course, you cannot work up to a shoulder because of the 45 degree lead. Well, if you can live with that much of an edge chamfer, you can use them for, <laughs> for turning a shoulder too. But that's not the case here. So we align the tip of the tool with, with the edge of the part. just by eye using magnification. Um, I tuned back the feed to 30 microns per rev. And first of all, we will create the 45 degree shoulder here with allowance and then we will to, to take two finishing passes. I have 0.5 millimeters of allowance on here, so I'm taking 0.25 millimeters of cut, measure it, and then do my final cut. So this is 10.26. I dialed in 10.25, so we are 10 microns off. But this is a, a non-critical dimension. So we're just dialing in 10 and we go under 10 microns. So we should hit nominal perfectly. There we go. We turned right up to our shoulder and this is, this is already final geometry now. Now we change to a different tool. This is a CCMT06 insert with a very small corner radius. This is like a 0.2 millimeter corner radius. And we'll finish this diameter here. 
So again, this is 12.5 millimeters. Now we take a cut to 12.25. Okay, check our dimension here. So this tool is dialed in better, 12.25. We ignore the last digit. This is really not, this doesn't make sense in this case. So 12.25, that's exactly what I dialed in on the DRO. So we can adjust to 12 and we should hit our dimension pretty good. Okay, let's do a quick inspection of those two diameters before we do something else. So this is 12, slightly over. And this is 10, slightly over. This allows for polishing, so perfectly fine. We need a one millimeter chamfer here. For this, I'm not using the insert. I'm using a solid carbide tool that has a lapped cutting edge. I prefer this for a large clean chamfer because it cuts nicer. So we just make contact until we see a tiny chip forming here and we zero out the DRO and then we move in one millimeter. And as you can see on the finish of this chamfer, that's the benefit of a lapped carbide tool compared to a sintered insert. And this is a two millimeter wide grooving and turning tool. You can move into the material and then move side to side with it, which is neat. Um, we'll pick up the end of the part here just by bringing it into contact, bumping against the face of the part very lightly and we zero out the DRO, retract it and then we, and we take two plunge cuts, remove the waste in the center and then we traverse to clean up the floor. Okay, you saw me taking cut left and right and then removing the waste in the center. That's also the recommended way of removing a lot of material using a parting tool, not um, plunging, plunging next to each other. That way the parting blade does not deflect as much or doesn't at all. Okay, that's the groove. Now we take a needle file that has a safe edge ground onto it. This is just done on the surface grinder, removing all the serration, the cutting serrations and rounding over the edges with a Kratex wheel. So when you make contact with this, with the part, you do not cut into the part. 
So when we deeper the edges of this groove, of this white groove, we're not damaging the floor here. Followed by Kratex stick. Kratex or uh, any other brand, this is a an abrasive, in this case it's silicon carbide, embedded into a rubber, a polyurethane rubber. And you press this against a part and you just work the part with it. It doesn't remove much material, but it removes all tiny burrs, creates a, a micro radius on the edge and it leaves just a nice product. As you can see, the Kratex really makes a difference. Uh, last step on the OD is to, to polish the groove. I'm just taking a, a small, a narrow strip of 400 grit emery cloth and run it through the slot. There we go, good enough. Uh, now we need to drill. The, the final part will be drilled all the way through, but in this case, we're just drilling like, like a little bit over halfway through there. And then when we, once we part it off and do the other side, we'll drill from the other side and finish it. These days I do 99% of my drilling with a small Albrecht chuck in a multi-fix boring bar holder, holding it in the tool post. And you will see in a second why. First of all, we center the tool. I can do that using the DRO. So we're center drilling. Then we have a 2.5 millimeter drill. This goes, this goes halfway through the part. There you just saw why I prefer drilling with the with the carriage of the lathe instead of the tailstock. When drilling deep holes and you need to eject the chips very often, um, you get you get pretty old pretty fast when you have to crank that bloody tailstock in and out all the time. Now we follow up with a 3.9 millimeter drill because there's a stepped hole. There we go. And there will be done some ID turning on these parts from this side, but I will do those as the last step. There is a reason for that. Once the part is drilled through all the way, I can run compressed air through the spindle of my lathe from the back side and eject the chips out towards the tool and give it clearance to cut because the tools I'm using are very close to the ID of the bore we're just creating. This is a four millimeter hole and the boring bar that goes in there is basically 3.95 millimeters. So uh, chip clearance is a real issue and with running compressed air from the back, it helps to, to get the chips out of there. 
that's the reason for the additional step. Otherwise, I could just do all the ID turning now in this setup. I tried that before, but uh, it worked, but it's not too much fun. So here's a, a wait. First, we use a 60 degree countersink. 60 degree because that's what's specified in the drawing. Followed by a four millimeter Rima. Okay, last step is to use the same grooving tool that we used before to part it off. And there we go. That's the final product so far. Okay, let's change collet. If I see collet check, you need to turn the wrench about five million times. Oh, that's the that's the remaining material. Oh, by the way, that's something I started to do. All material that comes in gets stamped with the number, the the alloy number. This is a one forty three oh five stainless steel. It's a free machining stainless steel. And by stamping it, you do not accidentally rub it off with alcohol or acetone. You don't um, have a tag around it that interferes with the collet and it's just, it's there. And if you have a good day, you do both ends of the stick. So if you cut it in, in half <laughs> or accidentally machine off the, the marking, you're still not in trouble. But if I have a material that I'm not certain what it is means it's not stamped or engraved, on some materials, I just engrave it with die grinder. Um, if I do not know what it is, I cannot use it for a customer part, period. So mark all the things. Let's take a random piece of stock out of my uh, scrap bin. See, 14301. And it even has the diameter stamped here, 36 millimeters. So this is still a useful chunk of material because I know what it is. Or even this piece here, this is a heat treated stainless steel, something about 34 Rockwell C. And even this has, I, I cored it out with a, with a rotor brooch because I needed a small diameter of this material and I could only get a, like a 30 millimeter stick of it. And even this has 14418 engraved on it, which is the alloy number. This is the ISO system, uh, one number before the point and then four numbers be behind it. You need a, a, a table to or the data sheet or you memorize the important ones. Or even this, this is a small test piece. And this is 17225. This is 42 chromoly uh, equivalent. It's just a drop that I used for something else. And I still know what it is and I'm still happy about that. So mark all the materials. So back to a collet chuck. I made the adapter for the collet chuck very early on <laughs> because uh, hand cranking the collet wrench is not that much fun. And we use a microfiber rag to clean up the spindle taper because when you use compressed air and cutting oil, um, things get in there and can cause problems with the precision. There we go. Align it with the key. And now we are able to take these parts and grab it on the final finish diameter here in the collet and not do damage to it. I'm not setting a collet stop because I need the through hole to, to clear the chips later. We start with our CCMT06 insert, finishing insert, and we take a light facing path on this part to get rid of the parting blade surface. And 
Okay, now we take the part out. We measure the length. Uh, 35.47, so we have to take off 0.47 millimeters to get to our final length. Non-critical according to the drawing. Oh, uh, these are by the way super neat. These are the, the mini, mini permanent marker from Edding. And as you can see, they are mini. And the reason I like them, because they are cheap. Uh, they come in a bag of, I think, 10. And usually I damage the tip beyond rescue on these and not run out of ink. So the small ink reservoir on these is not a drawback for me. But they are cheap enough and have enough ink and always have a nice tip on them. So they are easy to replace. As usual, we take a measurement. 10.246. I My DRO reads 10.248, so we're pretty close. And we take our final cut to 10 millimeters, nominal. Okay, we need a 20 degree chamfer on the end here. And I have a, a, a tool, 20 degree. This is just a piece of six millimeter carbide split in half on the D-bit grinder and then ground to 20 degrees and hit on the diamond lap for a good finish. Okay, we run this pretty slow, maybe two or 300 RPM. Okay, we need cutting oil with us a tool this wide or coolant. There we go. That's a nice 20 degree lead in chamfer. Next we need a groove. This is a horn triangular grooving insert. And I lapped it to 1.1 millimeter width. This used to be 1.2 millimeters. And we just bumped the tool up against the side of the part here. This takes some practice, so you can do this without deflecting the blade and get repeatable results. But I'm doing this for years now this way, and it works very well. Okay, this is a very shallow groove. There we go. Get rid of it. Time for the needle file again. Okay, all the OD turning is done. Uh, let's quickly check the diameter because I did not measure it after my finishing cut. Good enough. Each time I show drilling with the drill chuck in the carriage on the on the on the tool post, I get asked how I center the, the drill chuck to the work. And the answer is easy. 
You put an indicator in the spindle with a very short overhang to make it reasonably stiff so you don't suffer from too much indicator sag due to gravity. You sweep either a pin in a drill chuck or the ID of the of of the boring bar holder or something else. Just sweep it, get it on center, and you save that position in your DRO. But reality is that drill chucks are not very accurate, even this Elbrecht chuck that I rebuilt. And when you use, for example, a center drill, you will see it move to center when you drill and it gets a little bit deflected. And you use that deflection as a cue how to, to adjust the position of your cross slide to get the tool on center. You just watch it and see the drill bend and deform even more with a longer drill, a smaller diameter drill like this 2.5 millimeter drill that we're going to use now. This bent very slightly. I adjusted a tiny bit on the cross like 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 60 microns and now I get a very even nice chip and now I'm able to drill all the way through. That means with a little bit of practice you don't even need to sweep with an indicator, it just can eyeball it, even with a very, very small drill, like a 0.5 millimeter PCB drill. You just take a magnifier, look what the drill does when it hits the center mark. If you use a very stiff spotting or center drill, the center mark will be on center because it's always at the center of rotation. It's a, it's a given. You can, it's, it's almost impossible if you do good practice to put an off center spot drill on a lathe. Except for a live tool lathe, of course, but that's not what we're talking here. So this is the internal grooving tool and later we'll do a cutoff part. I will mill half of the part away and you will see what's happening. But for now you, you will see what I see when I do the part. I've compressed air routed through the spindle of my lathe to help me clear the chips a little bit. It's loud as, as all can be, but it works a bit. So here we go. We don't run too fast, just like this. This is maybe 200 RPM. I touched off on the end of the part with the edge of the tool. Now we go into the bore, move to our position uh, using the DRO and turn the spindle on and move this way. This is the most critical operation. This ID grooving tool is really on the edge of, of being uh, reasonable. That's a tool that I ground that cuts a 30 degree undercut in both directions. And I need that to clear out a, a small section in the back there. This is not a critical tool. Um, this is very easy to run. Uh, zero point is the front tip here, the, this corner. And they just use a magnifier to align this with the work. Okay, that's good enough. I know that this is already my zero in the DRO. Just wanted to show you. So then we move in 10 millimeters. This is again blind operation. Then we pull the tool out to our target diameter and move it in this direction to create the undercut.
The drawback when running compressed air through the spindle and the part like I did here, it's so loud you do not hear the cut. And with, with weird tools like this one, it, that's uh, kind of a key component to be sure that the tool is actually cutting nicely. You can get a little bit of feedback through the hand cranks of the machine, but hearing the cut is also very important if it's scratching or if it's smoothly taking cut. So that's the reason why I turned the air off later. And that's, by the way, my solution for running compressed air through the spindle bore of the slave. Just my magnetic base with a lock line hose, a hose going over there to a pressure regulator. So that's, my, that's also what I use when I need compressed air up here. I just put this on the, on the cross slide of the lathe. And this quick coupler here makes it easy to disconnect the hose. And I have these fittings also on the back side of my boring bars. Like on this one, this allows me to run compressed air through this boring bar. For example, when I do hard boring to clear out the chips, you can see the bore here. This is where the air exits and hits the CBN insert. So that's very useful. As you can see, I prepared another part. This time it's brass because it's easy and fast to machine. Drilled the 2.5 millimeter hole all the way through and then did the same hole prep with the four millimeter hole, 30 degree chamfer and ream on it. And now and then I milled away half the thickness of the material. And now we'll, we'll see if we can make this a little bit more clear what's happening here. But I think you saw me create this undercut reasonably nice. So now we can change to the hook tool or ID grooving tool, whatever you want to call it. In German it would be a Hockendriemeißel. So we have tool number 26. Zero out the DRO in the C direction move into slightly under four millimeter diameter so we can clear into the bore like this and this gives us room to to, to get the boring bar into the bore and not damage anything and now we can just plunge outwards Um, the neat thing when you can cut, cut away half the part is, of course, chips are not a problem anymore. And inspection is also way easier. But usually customers don't accept parts that are only partially there.
And that's basically how the steel part looked on the inside, just as I said, this is just so you can see what's actually happening and not just <laughs> seeing numbers on the DRO move around. So because the internet will yell at me, because I said I did something else than I said in an earlier video, I used a center drill to spot for the, the screw hole on this part. And back when I did my center drill video, I said, don't do that. Because when, uh, let's see, we have, when you put in a proper large center with one of these drills, you have a 60 degree cone here, 60 degree. And when you come in with a 118 degree drill bit with a regular one, uh, that's a very unstable condition. That's uh, really not very nice for the drill and also the centering characteristics for the drill are a little bit shitty. It starts to, it will for a second vibrate and that can throw off your center. But what I did when I used this the center drill, <laughs> I used only the tip. Duh, <laughs> that's easy. Uh, so that's the material. So these have a tip angle of, of about 120 degrees, which matches a regular 118 degree twist drill quite nicely. So, and I like to use these sometimes because they're very short and very stiff when you, when you choke up on them in a drill chuck like this. And then I only use the conical tip in front here for centering and that's very fast, very reliable. This up here has another drawback. When you drill that deep, uh, these tend to break off. And everybody who has ha ever had to dig out the tip of a center drill from a workpiece knows that it sucks. So, nope. This is fine in my book. Uh, just using the extreme tip here is perfectly fine. Just don't do this. This is a clear nope. Or get a proper NC spotting drill. Something like this if you need a larger spot drill or a larger spot. This is how I made these 12 parts. They will need a little bit of polishing on the inside but that's, uh, that's another topic. I hope you enjoyed these making apart videos. Thank you all for watching and I'll be back.